So the Nitro gang, um, which is the gang that was responsible for a recent Java Zero Day vulnerability in particular, I think that was CVE 2012-4681, and I actually had made a recent video about this particular vulnerability, uh, has actually come up with a new vulnerability, and it's a Zero Day, and it targets Internet Explorer, and in particular, it targets the in the wild exploits rather target uh, version 7 and 8 of Internet Explorer. But subsequent to that, actually, there has been some work on um, creating exploit code for other versions of IE. And in particular, um, in the Metasploit toolkit, you can actually find exploits for IE9 as well. Uh, and actually, I should also point out that Metasploit uh, also has exploits at work on Windows 7, uh, Windows 7, and also on Windows Vista. And uh, in contrast, the original, the original exploit code focuses only on Windows XP. So really, um, the in the wild exploits target 7 and 8 of IE on Windows XP, and then the Metasploit versions also expand that to version 9 as well as Windows 7 and also Windows Vista. Now, because we're talking about a zero-day vulnerability here, um, that means that even if you have a, a currently patched system that's up-to-date and, and so on and so forth, you will still be vulnerable until a new patch is made available that actually addresses the core underlying vulnerabilities. Now at a high level, the way this vulnerability works is as follows. Imagine you have a user and the user is uh, led to a page and, and we're going to call this web page um, exploit, exploit.html. And what exploit.html is really going to be is it's going to be the entry point uh, for the overall attack. Okay, and in particular, what exploit.html is going to do is it, it's um, really going to be used to uh, load a Flash movie, and then the Flash movie here uh, is, is actually called, in the context of the attack, uh, moh2010.swf. Okay, and it's important to keep in mind, these are the names that you might find uh, in the actual, uh, in the exploit code that's been found in the wild, but really the names can be different. For example, maybe a more innocuous sounding name might be used instead of exploit.html. All right, and ultimately to get the user to this particular page, you have to use some type of social engineering mechanism. And, and this may be um, through any, any mechanism whatsoever just to trick the user. But the, the key point here is that once the user simply visits the page, at that point the user system will become compromised even if the user doesn't do anything else after that point. Uh, and so what's going to happen is, is moh2010.swf will be loaded. And this is a Flash movie. All right. In particular, what, one note about in this particular exploit is this Flash movie is actually packed. And it's packed using a packer known as DOSWF or DOSWF. Do basically, the packer um, is used to basically encrypt and obfuscate the files in question. And that just makes it more difficult to analyze the underlying contents. And really, packed content is typically unpacked on the fly so that it can be interpreted by a computer. Now, now packing, I should mention, is used to help deter things like software piracy, but it's also a tool that a lot of malware authors and exploit authors use to make reverse engineering attempts by security researchers that much more difficult to mount. All right? Uh, and I should also mention that the DW or DOSWF DOSWF has been used in other exploits, so its presence here alone uh, might be a bit of a signal that something is potentially awry, but uh, you know, it's not a good standalone indicator because there are, again, legitimate use cases for packers. So this particular Flash movie, MOH2010.SWF, performs what's called a heap spray. A heap spray. And, and let me explain what a heap spray is. Basically, in a heap spray, um, you target an area of memory known as, not surprisingly, the heap. So imagine you have uh, your, your computer's memory here, and, and this is all one, one big system, okay? Okay, and what's going to happen in a heap spray is that um, the heap, which is, a, which is a data structure in memory, um, is going to be, uh, parts of the heap are going to be overwritten with uh, various pieces of code or various instructions, okay? Now, I do want to mention again briefly here that, that a heap spray in and of itself is a technique that actually help set the stage for a subsequent exploit that's geared towards the execution of, of arbitrary code on a system. But a heap spray in and of itself does not actually exploit a technical vulnerability. It's just used as a precursor to the actual use of exploit code. All right. So um, you know, if you were to write, let's say, exploit code to take advantage of a vulnerability, and, and this is something you might have to deal with in practice, typically you have to deal with things like very practical issues like memory alignment and attack timing and, and so on and so forth. 
And in a heap spray, the idea is to basically write some values to specific data structure in memory. This is the data structure known as the heap or the system heap. And these values basically correspond to instructions. And these instructions, uh, in turn, uh, you know, can be interpreted. And, and typically, uh, most of the instructions in heap spray, actually, the, the leading instructions are typically what are called no-ops. And these are instructions that don't actually do anything. And the reason you have a whole bunch of no-ops is that uh, the, the heap in, a, in, a, in an exploit, typically, you don't always have precise control over the exact place at which uh, the exploit code can actually overtake execution doesn't know exactly the exploit code may not be able to pinpoint the precise location on the heap where it's going to be able to transfer execution. So exploit code usually has to write a bunch of no ops so that um, they have a bit more slack in that regard. And then after after the no ops, you, you typically will have some type of shell code or really code that's going to do the real damage. All right. So as long as you get somewhere in this list of no ops, or what's called a no ops sled, you, you'll be you'll be fine when you're writing an exploit. All right. And so what's going to happen is, is um, you know, if the application, if the exploit code can basically trick the application into getting into this part of memory and ex executing code in here, um, then you know damage can be done to the underlying system. And so the real trick is how do you get that that to happen in this particular case? So let me actually get back to the case of this particular exploit. Um, so what happens here is, is this MOH 2010 SWF mounts a heap spray, it writes this code to the heap, all right, and then it's got to trick the rest of the application. And it does that, it starts off by basically loading MOH 2010 at SWF loads a new file called protect, protect.html, all right? And what is protect.html? Well, protect.html is really the file in which the main exploit code is located, all right? And what this basically, what this file basically does is it, it basically takes advantage of what's called a use after free vulnerability. Let me kind of write that down, a use after free vulnerability. And, and um, in this particular case, the use after free vulnerability occurs um, uh, after the exploit code sets up what's called an image URL, referencing a section of memory that's actually uninitialized. And then when you're um, exploiting the vulnerability, what effectively happens is control is passed over to the code on the heap, and then we execute from there. All right, so the, the exploit code basically tricks the application to transferring control over to the heap. And then once control is transferred over to the heap, the bad, you know, you, you might get to the no ops lead, and then finally you'll actually execute the really bad shell code. And at the end of executing this really bad shell code, uh, the, the, uh, the, the exploit code will basically cause a payload, a malicious payload, to be dropped onto the underlying system. And, and, and in this particular case, for this particular vulnerability, the, the, the code that's actually dropped, the payload that's dropped rather, is known as the, the Poison IV Trojan. And, and Poison IV is actually a remote backdoor or remote access uh, Trojan. And you know, I, I should also mention Poison IV was used as well in In the Wild exploits of CVE 2012-4681. So it is one that's been seen before and has been used before by the Nitro group. Uh, but I do want to stress that uh, you know, it doesn't have to be poison ivy. I mean, the same exploit code or, or modification of that exploit code could, in principle, be used to drop any other type of malicious payload on the system. In other words, there may be different ways to exploit a given security vulnerability. All right, and I do want to mention one last point before ending this video, and that is that, you know, even if you don't use Internet Explorer explicitly, uh, some of the applications you might use to go on the web or to access the web they may themselves use Internet Explorer underneath. And so it's worth being a bit more careful for the time being until a patch is made available for this particular zero-day exploit.